if you're enjoying the podcast, subscribe to us, um, like us, et cetera. Click the bell so you get a, a notification. We're going to do this every week. Um, particularly what we'd like to have from you is is topics that you might like to have us discuss on the show. You can do those in the YouTube comments below. Um, we'd love to hear from you and uh, put them on the list. Well, we can't do everything, but we'll we'll sure try to get uh, get the big questions you have answered or little questions too. So we'll do um, the ones that look like they'll be fun for everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next topic I'd like to talk about. Let's see. Next, next subject um, is the superbike book. So Kevin's Kevin's just whiling away in his spare time and suddenly there's this super bike book. And if you haven't seen it, maybe you have a copy you could show us, Kevin. There it is. You have to pull back. <laughs> no, it looks so yeah, that's the cover. That's a John Owens photo. And um John Owens and Kevin Cameron were both on the race circuit. I mean Kevin's been on the race circuit, what, since 65-ish? 65-ish, yes. Yeah, 65 is. You know, I think you've re relayed to me in the past that you you thought you might be a road racer yourself. And uh, the results uh, were not satisfying. <laughs> so you switched to tuning. But uh, yeah, so you were on the you were on the circuit. You had been an AMA technical uh, inspector and... 1988. Yep. And um, John Owens in the 70s, you know, took his Nikons to races and he was an enthusiast and he started working and, and taking photography and uh, with, you know, manual focus cameras. And you guys have been, you know, friends ever since. Tell us, uh, tell us how it, it began. Well, uh, years ago, John had said to me that he had the ambition that the two of us should do a book of some kind. And I thought, hmm, yes, after all these things that we both had to do, make a living, uh, keep a family together, the problems. And uh, but eventually he he said, let's do it now. What I would like to do is bring you a Mac computer on which are several hundred images that I've selected from my files, which go back to 1975. And if you should feel while looking at these images, like jotting down a few words, I'd appreciate it. And so uh, I started to look at the images and so many things sprang out. Oh, look at this bike's got, a, got four megaphones on it that's really old or oh well there are no dust uh, scrapers on this front fork so that means that's a sort of middle period superbike <laughs> and i began to write commentary now mind you this was never intended to be this is a history of american superbike it began when i just wrote down what how it struck me and it must have struck me pretty hard because before I knew it, I had 30,000 words. That's, that's, well, that's adequate. <laughs> yeah. And you won't find them all in this book. But um, what's important about this period is that starting in 73, Japan began to put great big engines into what were basically 1960s chassis with 1960s tires and uh, suspension didn't work very well and people private people were racing these big thousand cc bikes notably the kawasaki z1 and the uh suzuki gs series 750 first then the then the thousand and people loved to watch them because they they wallowed and they wobbled and the hero riders were sitting up with wide handlebars. Uh, remember the talking blues? They ride motorcycles with high rise bars. They go up so high, they don't know where they are. Well, 
you couldn't exactly tell where these people were because their bikes were misbehaving in such fundamental ways. And the Japanese began to notice, wait a minute, we might be able to move some units with this kind of racing. And so the privately entered bikes were sort of pushed downfield by factory bikes with professional riders on them. And it was a curious time because on the one hand, there were drag race guys who were saying, oh, no problem. I can build a 15,000 RPM killer motor that'll put you on top anywhere. And of course, those engines lasted about 1,320 feet. And I remember uh, Rob Muzzy telling me in 1982, things start to go bad real quick at 11. <laughs> so uh, this was a time of transition. The Japanese and their American teams were frantically modifying these bikes, throw away the fork, throw away the wheels and the brakes, throw away the swing arm, reinforce the frame. Uh, the fuel won't feed, raise the gas tank up. Oh, we need all these. And what resulted from this was the second generation of big, powerful sport bikes, which began with the uh, Honda Interceptor. And they had, the, the factories had said, oh, we have a division which races in the Grand Prix in Europe. Maybe they know something about these handling problems, <laughs> tire problems, suspension problems. The second generation was a big improvement. But people remain, to this day, remain fascinated by those giant racers with hero riders like Eddie Lawson and uh, Wayne Rainey wrestling with high, wide bars, and, of course, they made that lovely motorboat sound that all the two-stroke haters thought was heavenly. Yeah. And everything was changing so fast. I remember standing by the Superbike Tech line at one point in the mid-70s, and a kid came running up to one of the uh, bikes and said to the people that were waiting in line with it, they, they just let a set of electrons through. And then the line vanished. Everyone went back to their garage because every race had a different tech inspector with a different opinion of what is or should be legal. And so every team had to carry the stock carburetor. The stock carburetor bored out. Uh, Cahin CRs, which I think are very beautiful. Electrons, Quicksilvers, you name it. And so they had to have all these setups and know how to make them work. So it was a time of, of frantic catch up. And I think that at the present time, the baggers class in Moto America is something similar. They started with a motorcycle that was never intended to road race and they have made it into something quite respectable because no, they're re yeah they're yeah. remarkable it, it's a, it is a super bike now they're both uh, the the top teams are racing bagger super bikes there's no other way of putting it yeah and uh, uh one of those baggers which people love to to point fingers and say it's not a real motorcycle and this and that and the other thing um let's face it a motorcycle is an engine, two wheels, and some place to sit. The rest is extra. So uh, know this about baggers, that the bagger lap record at Laguna Seca is faster than Eddie Lawson's 500cc Yamaha GP bike record from 1988. Now, all right, course, so... Tires yeah. have come a long way. There's been yeah. all sorts of kinds of changes, but... That just tells you how fast this thing moves. Yeah, let's put that on the next topic list is, is we got to do a show about baggers. Yeah, because so, we've, we've enjoyed them. Such, they're they're <laughs> yeah. really uh, irony at the highest degree. 
Yeah, it's so American. It's so beautifully American. It's just sort of like, you know, we got air compressors, let's race them. We got, you know, I mean, NASCAR is not Mustangs. NASCAR is was based on huge land yachts that everybody bought. Yeah. And or they ran moonshine in because they were big, whatever it was, you know, so we'll, we'll get to that. I, I one of the you know, in talking to you about the book, one of the questions I would have is surely John wasn't just shooting super bikes <laughs> and probably has a, you know, a, a library that is massive and and covers everything. So talk about sort of why Superbike or how, how it came to be focused in this way. We would like to take a moment to say that this show is made possible by Octane, our parent company, Octane Lending. Uh, you can visit octane.co. We'll have a link in the description on segaworld.com. You can go visit what we call the widget. Uh, you can read a bike test and et cetera, and you'll notice uh, a tool that allows you to get pre-qualified for a loan on that model or any model. You can shop on Cycle World or on octane.co. So check out the link. Uh, this show would not be taking place without their support. Well, there was a, there was a, an identifiable story that could be pulled out from the background of so many photographs, but, um, our friend, Matthew Miles, um, basically said, you're going to have to make a story here. You can't just say, well, here's a bunch of pictures I took at the races. Uh, here's a GP bike and over here is a, some other thing. And so the, the first cut was to take the first 10 years of Superbike, which was really the 1,000cc sit-ups and the transition period. So that's 1975 to 1985. It includes the beginning of the second generation because the um, Honda Interceptor arrived in, uh, in 83. So, uh, and the, the, the rest were, this, this was the thing you see, the industry had, had in quotes learned that the only thing the public cares about is quarter mile time and top speed. Give them a good number, should sell some units. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, uh, people were interested in handling, or I should say, handling became a subject of discussion. So the first 1,200 um, interceptors sold out, twing, and the owners went around telling everyone, man, this thing, this thing is really different. The fact that it was different is owed to that intense period of sit up thousand CC racing because nobody had brakes that were satisfactory. Uh, some of those bikes, the rear wheel, the moving mass at the rear of the bike was 65 pounds. So um, the shocking. wheels went in the trash. Yeah. Uh, when Honda jumped in in 1980, uh, there was uh, Steve McLaughlin buying $12,000 worth of titanium valves and, and uh, titanium rods at a whack coming in crates, you know, with, with cardboard dividers <laughs> with all these rods in there. Right, and that's not $2024, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so That's house money. <laughs> yep. So they, uh, that intense period of development showed that there was a market for a better handling, a sports motorcycle, not just a, a quarter mile missile. Certainly, well, when I visited Kawasaki in uh, 1972 in the fall, the only test track they had was a drag strip <laughs> and it was instrumented. And there was a quaint little house with the peaked roof that had all the timing equipment in it. And there was a, a technician on duty. So uh, times are changing so fast. And that's when things really get exciting. The ideas come out. Some of them are completely crazy. Some of them are surprisingly good. And the result was that second generation. And of course, the third generation is... Uh, the the GSXRs and interceptors and uh, ZXs and what have you uh, of the present day. So, 
but but there had to be a cause, a driving force, and that was that seeing these motorcycles go fast on a road course somehow excited people. Well, I mean, okay, I think it's a let's, we'll accept it. We love our prototypes. We love MotoGP, but that identifiability, particularly with those bikes, because they were so basically exactly what you were getting off the showroom and then everything was thrown at them. I think that identifiability and that they, that they were sit up bikes and they did have the high bars that it's sort of like, yeah, I could do that, you know, or yeah. So I think the identifiability is there. Certainly we love our prototypes, but also these, these became prototypes. And I think, I think one of the, the most remarkable things about the book, I mean, of course, what, what you did, like I, in the review I wrote, you know, basically what you said earlier about, oh, this is, you know, not an exhaustive history. I'm not sitting, I'm not starting with the beginning of Superbike and results and massively researched of all that stuff. It's all of the cultural and other things happening around racing. And that's what John captured, uh, photographer John Owens captured so beautifully with his manual focus black and white film cameras. I mean, there's some color, but black and white film cameras and he's processing the film. And I think, you know, I, I look back, like I'm a photographer. I've done photography for cycle world here and there. I mean, I'm our photographer, Jeff Allen would call me an editor with a camera. (laughs) So, but, um, you know, I'm a hobby photographer also. And I have, I have the actual lens. I have a 500 millimeter F8 Nikkor C lens, which is a pretty derided lens in, you know, in sort of pro camera circles. It's a mirror lens. That means uh, it's light, but it also shoots kind of dark, like looking through it. It's sort of like looking into, it's like looking into dusk, like even in bright sun, I'm looking at aircraft or I'm trying to shoot, you know, uh, vintage races with it when I go to road America in the summer, things like that. And I just, my awe and respect for somebody like John who shows up and gets a product, particularly with a very challenging lens. He loved the lens and it is extremely sharp. And he said, he, he found me on Instagram and he's like, I have, I shot at, at least 15 photos in the book with that night core that, that yeah. I saw. And I was like, yeah. Oh my gosh. And then you can see because of the mirror lens, it gives you this really weird, uh, donut, um, bouquet in the background. So the stuff that's out of focus, out of the depth of field has this kind of circular sparkle to it. Some people <laughs> find it distracting and certainly yeah. it's, it's a very much a signature of that lens. But as soon as he said that, I'm like, Oh my God. And I went back and I looked at the photos, the clarity and the scanning is spectacular. And anyway, I just mad respect. Like I just, for anyone in that era to do, I know everybody was manual focusing cameras and, and doing this, uh, you know, pulling the trigger and hoping for the best. And certainly he's edited down a, a huge collection, but his percentage of hit rate has to be amazing because these photos are, are stunning. And then the post work on them as scans, you know, the negatives are great. The scans are fantastic. And the, the post work to bring out the texture and he didn't just shoot action. That's the other thing I think is yes, what's so people. strong about it. It's so people oriented. It's the man in the van with the plan. It's the guy filing engine cases. Like you're never going to see someone filing engine cases in MotoGP or World Superbike. Probably not even in the AMA, you know, Moto America paddock. In because the class. engines come in a sealed case on and you They're, break you just, the seal. It's ready to start. It's got yeah. a dyno tag hanging from it. Right. You pop it in and you go and, and you it's know. A black it's, box. Yeah. And so it, to see all of that or the still life of uh, a bowl full of spark plugs, um, all I, the t- I, yeah. I came into uh, the, the garage area at Daytona during one of those years, one morning during practice. And in front of one of the garages, I don't remember whether it was Kawasaki or Suzuki, were, was a stack of five wrecked crankcases. That day's work. <laughs> <laughs> and the other garage had three crankcases. And in 19, 1982, uh, Honda had gone through all the engines they had built by Wednesday of Speed Week. And I heard them. Often they would blow on the way into turn two in the infield. And they made a crunch like somebody had stepped on glassware or a huge cockroach. 
not very dramatic. They didn't go bang. And the rider would then just lift up the bike and ride off into the grass, let the bike down, pops, possibly he would throw it down, and yeah. sprint for another one. So on that Wednesday morning, uh, they had set up build stands out in the sunny, it was a sunny day, and they were building new engines out of the parts truck. So this is why I say that this was a an intensely uh, motivated development exercise wherein street bikes designed to sell to you and me were given the task of racing. And it was a very improving exercise. Yeah. I think it's just, all of that is so beautifully captured in the book. You're, you know, I think you're going to make it in this business, Kevin. <laughs> so, um, no, you're just your ability to, to take the photograph and to contextualize because you, you, you don't say, you know, Billy passed Bobby or this guy won this race. I mean, you do in some cases say, this is what happened and this is what was going on, but it's also very much the feeling of being in the paddock and the feeling of, uh, well, you get a, you get a concept or feeling for the texture of the bikes and you see the side shot of the Honda Superbike engine and you see handmade, uh, linkage and you see springs, you see all the safety wire, you see the texture of the brakes and AP Lockheed and all that. And the narrative quality of your words in these photos is I think what makes it such a spectacular book. Like really in this type of, I think one of the best books I've read on motorcycles. I mean, there are many other incredible, there are many other incredible titles that we can go down and we can talk about tuning for speed. We'll do a book segment. There's you know, we can, we, we can books, do, no yeah, we can do. Yeah. I mean, there's so different, but in terms of a cultural cap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I see you're ready always. Um, it, it's, uh, we'll do something on that, but I, uh, if you ha folks, if you haven't seen the book somewhere, go to superbikebook.com and, and check it out and get a copy because it's it's a worthwhile addition to anybody's library.